Welcome to the Jonathan Ross Show. Let's have a look and see who is in my green room tonight. We have everyone's favourite funny man. He's starting Gavin and Stacey, the wrong man. He's about to start on the big screen alongside Johnny Depp. It's Mr James Corden, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Super talented. My next guest is a model. She's the newly crowned Strictly Come Dancing champion, the beautiful Abby Clancy. <laughs> Also on the show, uh, a guest who's interviewed just about everyone, from Obama to Putin, all the way down to Boris Johnson and even Nick Clegg. It is <laughs> Andrew Marr, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Good evening, Andrew. Thank you for joining us. And I'm super excited. We have one of Hollywood's coolest, most elegant leading ladies from Pulp Fiction, Kill Bill, so many others. It is the one and only Uma Thurman. <laughs> Hello, Uma. We have great live music tonight for you from the man whose debut album went straight into the charts at number one. Everyone wants to work with this guy. It is John Newman. <laughs> John Newman. <laughs> it was Valentine's Day yesterday. Did you all remember that it was Valentine's Day? Yeah. I hope so. My wife arranged a lovely romantic trip for us. We went to Iceland to try and see the Northern Lights, and I was so relieved that it was the beautiful country, not just the shop. <laughs> uh, and the scenery was amazing, although she did say that if she really wanted to go and look at a tired old geezer that only goes off three times a year, she could have stayed at home. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Good night. <laughs> uh, what about our guest, Abby? Uh, I, is Peter, is uh, Mr Crouch, is he a romantic kind of guy? Um, yeah, he, he has his moments. He's a bit dozy there on that side. And I know one for my engagement, he got the, the date of our engagement engraved into the ring. And I was like, what's that? And he was like, oh, when we got engaged, and it wasn't. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. But he tries. Maybe that was for some other girl. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously not. OK. <laughs> uh, there's a new smartphone app that sends you an alert whenever your baby has just filled their nappy. This is so you know when to change the baby's nappy. I don't know exactly what the alert would say. Presumably, download complete or something. <laughs> yeah, I don't even need that. James, how old's your little boy? Is he, is he still in nappies or is he out of nappies now? Uh, he, uh, no, he wears them to bed. OK. Uh, and so, would you need an app like that, do you think? No. <laughs> well, well, how would you know that he needed his nappy change? Oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You uh, absolutely know. <laughs> you, have you don't the need an app, you're well aware of it. <laughs> um, you know who won't be using this technology, don't you? Simon Cowell. Did you see this? He said in the papers this week that he will never, ever change a nappy. Not even Louis. He's never going <laughs> to change a nappy. <laughs> Let's get my first guest out, shall we? Yeah. He is the star co-writer of the multi-award winning Gavin and Stacey, the recent hit show The Wrong Mans, which I love. He's also about to host the Brit Awards for a record-breaking fifth time this coming Wednesday. Please go crazy for Mr James Corden! <laughs> <laughs> James Corden, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, James. Hiya. It's great to have you. Thank you for coming it's a, on. It's a real pleasure. Um, so, the Brits, Wednesday night... It's on Wednesday night, And yes. this is your fifth year? It's my fifth, yes. Do you feel any nerves at all, or are you now is it kind of oh, your domain? Yeah, no, oh, God, no. No. Uh, well, this, I'm not, this is the last time I'm going to do it. No, uh, why is uh, that? Uh, I feel like, as a show, it should always be young and uh, fresh, and also shouldn't... I, don't, I think as an event, it doesn't benefit from someone doing it the same every year. I think there's lots of award shows that do, and this isn't one of them. And I, uh, it's also, I, you know, it's not really what I do, yeah. and it's a, and I, I, I find it really nerve wracking. I, 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 it's the most nervous I ever am in my life. Uh, but you must, it must be fun to do so. When you're in, I know it's nerve wracking in advance, but there must be moments during the course of the evening where you think, well, I'm hosting the Brits. Oh and yeah, it's going great. The day of the show is incredible because. You do a full dress run in the afternoon uh, from about sort of one o'clock. We do an actual dress run with all the acts performing in an empty arena wow. to essentially just me. That's something. Like I'm just sort of there yeah. watching and, I, and every year I think, oh my goodness, this is amazing getting to watch these people in an empty place. And they really go for it and do it as it, as it is live. And then, so the actual day is great and backstage is amazing and it feels like it's the centre of something really happening. And then, at some point, they go, and you're live in five, four, and you just think, oh, don't ruin your career tonight. <laughs> <laughs> that's, it's, that's it. It's a, it's a constant feeling of don't ruin 
your career tonight. Just don't say something wrong. Who's performing this year? You said you get oh, this kind of uh, afternoon show just for you. Mm. Who will you be seeing this year? It's amazing this year. Uh, the Arctic Monkeys are opening the show and uh, Bastille and Rudimental, Ellie Golding, Katy Perry, wow. Bruno Mars. It's as good a lineup as it's ever that's, been that's since I've be been great. hosting it. Yeah. Do, and do you know who you can chat to on the night? Uh, yeah, no one's that. I'm sort of. I'm very much. No, they're all in a gang, and I'm off on my own oh, somewhere. <laughs> I'm like in another room, <laughs> so far away from the stage, with like sort of mops and booze. No, it's um. <laughs> genuinely, that's, you think I'm joking? Yeah. It's the actual truth. He, um, he has to clear up after some of the acts. <laughs> I thought that yeah. No, I. Well, yeah. No, I, yeah. You kind of see people around, but yeah, the, the bigger American acts are, tend to have. You know, lots of security outside yeah. the doors and things like that. And then there's other people who just wander around a bit more. Now, a few years ago, of course, there was uh, every presenter's nightmare on a live show where someone's giving a speech at the end. <laughs> it's a big moment. And you're told, we're going to collapse off air in a minute. You've got to wind this up now. You've got to go in and stop. This, is, of course, was Adele. Yeah. You went Were you surprised the amount of fuss that that kind of uh, caused after the event? No, not really. I, I think there's a, there's a long tradition with the Brits and news stories the next day. You know what I mean? I, I think there always has been, and so... <laughs> there, there, there it is. Yeah. I felt... <laughs> yeah. Because, you see, Adele didn't mind at all. <laughs> <laughs> she was actually really... Uh, she was incredibly sweet and understanding and was just more annoyed at the... You know, it's just... It's a hard call to make, is the truth. And um, um, uh, ever since the show moved and I, I sort of started hosting it on my own and it moved to the O2, I feel like it's become a slicker awards show and... Uh, and it was just a shame that something like that should happen. But for me, it was like, it was just horrible because, you, you know, you, I was told, like, James, we're running quite tight here. So I was like, OK. And then they go, and, and it was George Michael, and George came out and he gave a lovely speech. Quite, quite a long speech, I seem to recall. Sure, yeah. but, you know, I don't know if he'd been told. And then, and he says, the winner is Adele. And Adele, you know, understandably stands up and hugs every person at her table and you're just stood there going, oh, God. Yeah. And then the truth <laughs> is she got onto the stage and George gave her the award and, and that was the first time someone said to me, in my ear, James, you're going to have to go in and wrap up the show. And I was just thinking, well, that's not going to... I can't do that. That's ridiculous. And you can basically hear an argument going on of people going, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Stop, we're going to push the news. And then I was just sort of standing going... And she was going... And she even did this at one point. And I'm going, <laughs> and I'm going, and they're going, get in there, somebody, somebody, and someone's going, we'll just have to cut the feed. And I'm going, oh God. I was like, I can't allow her to not say thank you. Yeah. I can't, and she said, thank you so much. You don't know what this means. And then she started to say to go to America and win six Grammys. And I just went, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I've got to, you know. And uh, I, yeah, I just felt awful. Did you speak to her afterwards? Yeah, did you I them? ran straight to her room. Um, shouting. <laughs> I did, I did. I ran straight to her room. She wasn't there, her manager was there, and I was just, I was going mad. I was just like, every word under the sun came out. I was, ah. And then I, I went and shouted at some other people, and, uh, and, then there was some, and then there was some collective shouting, and then we all went, oh, no one's died, it's all yeah. right, you know? It's, yeah. it's just those, those things that matter at that absolute moment, and then you go, yeah. Oh, it's all right. You and know? you know what? She, she, she will win other awards and she will get to say uh, thanks yeah, again. And, uh, yeah, uh, and, and, you know, uh, yeah, she was really understanding. She yeah. was really, really Well, she's incredible, isn't she? Yeah, what a yeah she's incredibly uh, OK, I love seeing you. You're a very... Uh, James is a very talented, not just talented actor and performer, but also a very talented writer. Gavin and Stacey, what a great show Gavin and Stacey was. And congratulations <laughs> on the whole run of that last special with you first. Thanks very much. great for you. But I love the way you throw yourself in. I've been watching... I love watching uh, League of Their Own. This is the sports quiz uh, that James does over on Sky One. It's great fun, and you've got a great bunch of people with you. Jack Whitehall, of yeah. course, I adore, and Freddie and all those guys. But you really throw yourself in. What's the most fun you've had when they give you those challenges? And you're, what's the, what are the ones you've enjoyed the most? Um, well, I enjoy doing them all, really. We're, we're shooting the series now, and we've done some really good ones. We did curling the other day, which I really enjoyed. But curling isn't for exciting. Oh, it is when you're doing it. Is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It really looks just like kind of like bowls no, on but ice. No, it's like high-stakes bowls. Oh. It's really good. And so that, and then, I, and then in, a, in a couple of weeks, me and Freddie are going to fly a fighter jet. Yeah. But we're going to... We're actually going to fly it and do a 
Loop the loop, is I that, know. Is that wise? Because I've met Freddie and he's normally got quite a high alcohol blood level. Yeah. I, <laughs> my only proviso was I'm not in a plane with Fred. Oh, I'm not with him, OK. And they said, no, no, he'll be in a several hours. I said, of course I'll do it, you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Here's one of my favourites. This is when you did some synchronised swimming. Oh, God. But you've got the moves, girlfriend. Oh, I mean, you were really... Come now. You, you know, you... I think you could... You could this is a possible really? fallback for you. Sure. Yes. OK. OK, this is... No, you'll see. This is All James right. doing some swimming, synchronised. Please. Good entries. I'm looking around immediately to nail this start. Excellent arms there. Good synchronisation. There it goes. Yes. Yes. You see, you see what I'm talking about? Ben Thornton has the moves in the water. There's no doubt about it. That was a spectacular display. So ridiculous. That must have, but you must have got a bit of a thrill doing that. You, you look like you... You can't you in... breathe. You're just the whole time going... <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the whole feeling of doing it. You're just constantly going... <laughs> like that, that's it, you know. But, um, no, who who, who was it lifting you up at the end there? Cos that's a pretty good effort, they, <laughs> yeah, they it is. Is. <laughs> But if you notice, I go up quite quick, I come down very fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, let me ask you the big thing I want to ask you about, and I'm, I'm a big musical fan, I love musical movies and musical theatre. Stephen Sondheim is probably my uh, ultimate. Uh, James is uh, about to star. Well, he's already filmed it, I believe, but we yeah. will see it Christmas, is that It's one? out on Christmas Day, yeah. Stephen Sondheim's Into the Woods uh, with um, James Corden, Meryl Streep, this is mm -hmm. right, uh, Johnny Depp, yeah. uh, loads of other great people, Emily Chris Blunt. Pine, Chris Emily Pine, Emily Blunt, Chris Anna Pine Kendrick. Is... Wow. Um, and how was that to yeah. shoot? That must have been... Oh, I mean, just, uh, just the, the, the best filming experience of, of my life, definitely. It, it's directed by Rob Marshall, who directed Chicago yeah. and the last Pirates of the Caribbean film, and uh, I just loved it so much. Right. So, and do you have... Because The Baker's a big part of it. It's kind of a retelling, if you're not familiar with it, it's a retelling of a lot of different famous uh, fairy tales. Yeah. So there's a bit of Jack the Giant killing there, there's a bit of Snow White, there's a bit of... Cinderella. Little Red Riding yeah. Hood, all kind of mashed up together in a yeah. really fun, modern way. Mm. Do you have scenes, The Baker, does he have scenes with Meryl Streep? Yeah. She, I, I, she's all, the witch in it, isn't she? Yeah, all... I, all Almost all of my scenes are with Meryl, really. Me and Emily, Emily plays the baker's wife, and I, we're sort of the characters at the centre of the, of the film who sort of go on this journey into these woods. And, um, yeah, I mean, just being in a room with her, like, she's so aware of how you feel when so she you knows, go into she a knows room. Your she knows that she's Meryl Streep yeah. and you're you, and, <laughs> and so she does everything to just put you at ease, and, and she's, like... She takes the work incredibly seriously and doesn't take herself seriously one bit, and it makes for a lovely work atmosphere. It's, it's amazing. Uh, but you sing, you're actually singing this, because when yeah. you made the movie, you, you were in the movie last year, which I enjoyed, the, the one film Chance. One Chance, based yeah. on Paul Potts' life, but they didn't let you didn't sing, sing in, in that. that. No, was that because that, that was off It's because it's opera and yeah. I don't have the capabilities to do that. You but trained I, for it, though, didn't you? Well, I tried, and then it became clear that it wasn't going to happen. <laughs> Hard, um, harder than it looks. Yeah. yeah. And then, no, but I, I, everyone sings in Into the Woods. We all, we all sing, uh, yeah. But it's not sort of sung throughout, like Les Mis, there's scenes and there's yeah. songs. It's not, yeah, it's not all in song. No. Uh, could you give us a tiny bit of a song? Would you mind? Could we hear the voice? Could we hear a little bit of Sondheim song? <laughs> a, a, a long way off before Christmas. And if you're, if you're around, if we're on at Christmas, come on and do some stuff on the show with some of the other guys, because I love Sondheim. Oh, man. See, in the film, when... Um, it went, uh... Are you sure you were in this film? No, I'm, no I'm try you'll know how hard when I sing it now. It went, um, wait a minute, magic beans for a cow so old that you had to tell a lie to tell it which you told were they worthless, beans were they oversold, and would tell us who persuaded you to steal that gold, so it's your fault. Wow. <laughs> you see, that's what you're going to get. Uh, great having the show. I can't wait to see that movie in particular, but good luck with the Brits on Wednesday night. Ladies and gentlemen, the fabulous Mr. James Corden. Thanks, Thanks, so much. Thanks for the song again. That's a tough feat. Still to come on the show, we have Abby Pansy, Andrew Ma, Uma Thurman, and music from John Newman. Don't go away. <laughs>
Welcome back. Thank you very much. Let's get my next guest out here. She is a model who recently became Strictly Come Dancing champion and well-deserved it was too. If you didn't see it, and I, I think you probably did, but let's remind ourselves of her in a moment of triumph. The lovely Abby Clancy, hello, gentlemen. Hello. Abby Clancy. Lovely to have you here. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Hey, congratulations, though, on winning Strictly Come Dancing. Thank what you. a great result that was, <laughs> and what a fabulous performance. Uh, were you? I'm, I'm guessing you were a fan of the show before they asked you to do it, were you? I, I was, but I was a bit of a flicker between that and X Factor. Yeah. They have asked me to do it for a few years, and I just couldn't think of anything worse, to be honest. Humiliate yourself every week on what, telly so you... when you couldn't dance. <laughs> or, I don't know, I think after staying at home with my baby for a couple of years, I just felt like I needed a new... Uh, Challenge and yeah. strictly came up and I thought why not a few of my friends have done it and said it was the most amazing thing They've done so does Peter dance does Peter, Peter uh, you probably know this but he's <laughs> married to the great footballer Peter Crouch uh, Does he he does the robot when he wins a goal doesn't he uh, do they say win a goal when he scores when a goal? But he uh, I know he does it, but does he do, he doesn't do that kind of dancing I guess or does he like to dance? You know Pete was he would love to do the show He loves to dance and I used to come home every night and try and teach him, but he's so big it, it's it's impossible. I'm like Hulk was like that old. I mean, he, he couldn't go on it because he'd have to get like a six foot five girl to dance with him. But have they asked him as well? Have they asked him to do it? I think he couldn't do it. He, obviously, he's still playing for the Premier League. What Premier team? League, what, Premiership. Team's, what teams he play for now? <laughs> uh, I'm joking. Stoke. You're not joking. You were, <laughs> no, you didn't know then. No, I do. But you're not. So he came down to support you almost every week, didn't he? Whenever he could. Yeah, he finished the game and then he'd rush down okay. and meet me in the bar. And are you, the, <laughs> are you the same with the football? Do you rush to see him play every week? Can you not wait to get? You up know, to this Stoke season to... I haven't been to one game because wow. Strictly started at the same time. Um, so I, I haven't been. But is that a, a nice excuse for you to have, Abby? No, I, I love going to watch him play. It, it is, I'm not a huge football fan. I've been... My brother's a footballer as well for, uh, for a lower league, and my whole childhood I've been dragged to football pitches, freezing cold, so it doesn't really... I, I don't love it as much as I probably should. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, I'm, I'm excited to take Sophia, cos she really understands now and is excited when she sees her daddy on TV that must be playing. That's him. gorgeous, so I can't wait to take How old is your daughter now? She's two, is that right? She's three next three. month. OK, and uh, I know some people have given you some flack online about the way you dress her. <laughs> yeah. Is this right? And she, I think she's... The, the, we've got a little picture over here. She's wearing a kind of... It's quite, no, it's quite an unusual outfit. She's definitely got her own style. Yeah. We have absolute but mega... But look at that face. There's no... Look you're not... Face. You can't mess with her. No, she knows what she wants. <laughs> no, every day we have fights because she will not wear anything I pick her up. She won't let me put a brush through her hair. She wants to wear... P a favourite thing is, you know, when they have an accident in nursery and they give them, like, a spare T-shirt? Yeah. She wants to wear it, like, every day for the whole week. <laughs> Sleep in it. She wants to wear it every day, so... I just have to let her go with it, and I think it's nice for her to have her own style, even though it is a bit freedom. wacky. Yeah, yeah, that's a good thing. That's a nice <laughs> thing. Um, there, oh, there was some speculation. There always is. One of the things about Strictly Come Dancing, we all watch it, and you see, obviously, there's a certain intimacy yeah. that goes... Because you're close to... There's a good-looking woman with a good-looking man. Ali... Was his name? Ali Ash, your partner? Ali Ash. OK, and there was speculation. <laughs> oh, my God, there's something happening there. Mm. And that must be... I guess you must know that's going to come up before you even go in, don't you? Yeah, you do. I think it was one of the reservations I had about it really I didn't really want to bring any of that attention home and I was on the launch show I was desperate to have Robin because we had two days rehearsal and we got to dance with all the pros and I, I really connected with Robin and then when I didn't get him I, he got Deborah and I was crying my eyes out and got paired with Ali Ash but after a day of dancing you don't even think of, about anything like that and I know what went on and 
he knows what went on so it's not it's not like that you're just learning to dance and for him he was he was really keen on telling a story through dancing and he wanted it to be believable and you have to play a role like our first dance was Romeo and Juliet was quite awkward did anyone get off with anyone though <laughs> no. Did Deborah get off with anyone? No. <laughs> Did Brucey get off with anyone? Bruce may have, yes. Let me ask you about the, uh, the various rumours I read about you in the press. Because you get a lot of attention, I guess, because Peter's who he is and because now, you know, you're even better known now. And by the way, did you, did you notice, have people changed in the way they are towards you after Strictly Come Dancing, do you think? Yeah, a few of the cast were like, oh, I thought you'd be a bit of a, a, bit of a knob in real life, but, you know, <laughs> you know people, <laughs> people are a bit like, oh, God, you're actually all right. OK, here you go. These are some of the things I read. You've been reading guides on how to speak like a newsreader in an attempt to tone down your Scouse accent. Is that true? <laughs> no, that's okay. not true. Right, if it, Scouse and proud. Yeah, because if you were, it's not working. <laughs> OK. Uh, <laughs> and they're right. Why should you change? Uh, after Sophia was born, Pete bought you a fat-reducing suit to wear in bed to make you thin again. That was in one of the papers. No, he didn't, but I, what, it, what, it is even, what is that? Do they exist? Well, I'm wearing mine right now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you once got stuck on a roller coaster and were screaming for Pete, who was on the ground, as he'd been too tall to go on the ride. That's not true. <laughs> but he must be... I bet he's too tall for some rides. Probably. I don't know. <laughs> How tall is he? Six, seven. Oh, that's too tall. Um, <laughs> you chipped your tooth on the, at the Strictly Rap Party whilst drunkly attempting to eat the Glitter Ball trophy. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> My brother's got video evidence filming me in the car going, is it real? And it, I woke up and had half a front tooth. I was like, what the hell? Wow. wow. Well, it's fixed now. <laughs> well, you've done a good job. You sometimes <laughs> lie to Peter about how much money you've spent in the shops and put all of your bags into one so he can't see the evidence. <laughs> That's true, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> I think every girl does that now. No. They do. They do. Everything's £20 and everything just goes in one bag. And what, and what is the bag? Like a big pound shop bag? <laughs> a bin bag. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, OK, so um, the, at the moment, I guess, in, in terms of sport, in terms of Pete's life, they've they just had the transfer period, haven't they? Yeah. Is that right? And is that a stressful time to live through? Do you, is that tough for you? I mean, do you worry about what happens in his career? Because sportsmen have a kind of a short career, don't they, mm. really, in that, yeah. in that area? Like, before he went to Stoke, he'd come home and he was playing for one team and then a few hours later he was on the, in the car going up to Stoke for a medical and midnight we were... Move, moving there the next day. It's, that's it's, that's it's, kind of weird. That must yeah. be a kind of a weird thing. Uh, but you're but not... it's me. Well, he always goes away then, pre-season, and I have to pack the whole house up, and he comes back, and it's all laid out again. <laughs> so well, that's, that's harder for me. That, that's why he goes away, pre-season. Yep. That's exactly why that Good is. Good time. He's a lovely guy. I've seen you two together, and I was sort of spying on you. Okay? Yeah? Yeah. You did an Alan Carr show, and afterwards, and you were... Uh, and you were worried about how well it had gone and you, and you seemed, I don't want to be mean, but you seemed kind of needy and a bit worried about it. And he was incredibly supportive and I could see why it worked so I well. I was drunk that night. You were, so were you. I was very how drunk. How do you remember that? Because I was lying on the floor <laughs> in the taxi spying on you. <laughs> drunk. <laughs> drinking from one of Peter's boots. <laughs> uh, but that, I guess, is, uh, is why it works. He's, uh, you know, it's a real... Uh, it, it, you get from him what you need, and he gets from you what no, he needs. No, he's needs. amazing. He's my best friend. He's, he supports everything I do, and I support everything he does. And I think the fact we just get on so well is what makes it, makes it work. And, and are you going to have one? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Who started that applause? Because yeah, no, no. That was very sweet. You started it. For a minute, I thought you were going to be on your own, and I was worried for you. I was like... Um, and so, uh, are you going to have any more children? Have you got any more plans for that? Now you've got I'd, little I'd, I'd love to have more kids, you know. I'm, I'm one of four. I've always dreamed of myself having a huge family. I've loved every second of having Sophia. It's been just the most amazing time of my life. And, yeah, would love more of it. Well, now there's nothing stopping you. Now's the time, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, well, he's in, Dub he's in Dubai now, so... Well, he could, you know, he can come, <laughs> come back for an hour or however long it takes. <laughs> Twelve minutes or something. <laughs> Just once again, congratulations on the win, Thank which you. you so deserved. And I'm so pleased people have seen the real side of you, which is a <laughs> lovely thing. Ladies and gentlemen, Abby Clancy. <laughs> that is lovely. Thank you so much. Still to come after the break, Mr Andrew Marr will be out here. Uma Thurman and John Newman performing live. Don't go away. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.
welcome back to the show. Let's get my next guest right out there. He is a fabulous broadcaster. He's an acute political commentator. And I was shocked, as everyone was, I think, when I heard that he suffered a stroke and then filled by his remarkable recovery. He's here to tell us all about that and what he's doing at the moment. It's Mr Andrew Marr, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Andrew, great to have you on the show. Lovely to see you again. Fantastic to be here, Jonathan. Uh, I interviewed you a few years ago. You had a series out. You were doing it's one of your history series. Yeah, I seem to recall, which was great. Uh, and so that's why I'm, I was like everyone else. When I heard you had a stroke, I couldn't believe it because I'd always been so impressed by your fitness. You were clearly someone. I'm going to move this down here. Just to put this to one side here. I was always impressed by your fitness. Uh, so how did it happen? Well, it was as a result of exercising, obviously. It was a bit as a result of exercise. I'd been working too hard for a year. I'd been making the history of the world, which means huge amounts of flying around the world. It's a big topic. Really, really knackered, writing a book and all the rest of it. And then the thing that happened at the same time was that I used to run, as you say, about 25 miles every week. Wow. Um, um, but I knackered my knees, so I had to stop. And as a result, I took up new kinds of exercise, including, lethally, a rowing machine. Keep away from rowing machines, everybody. <laughs> Because the great thing about a rowing machine is you can work your body as hard as you possibly can and nothing goes pop until my artery went pop. Wow. I was trying to hit a really, really hard target in terms of number of miles I was rowing a certain amount of time and I hit the target I thought, great. And the minute I'd hit the target, I thought, I've done something really, really stupid. And then went back, served out the family meal. So, hold it, so, you, so you'd felt that something had happened but yes. you didn't know it was that serious and at the I time? I had no idea what it was. I just felt this weird sense of that was really stupid and I've done something silly, but I couldn't tell what it was. In fact, I'd torn my artery into the brain. Um, I went back in to the house, served up the family meal, which I normally do, didn't feel hungry. I had a kind of kaleidoscopic headache and m massive quantities of kind of multicoloured lights in front of my eyes. And then I went, went and watched a George Clooney film. Big mistake. Hold it. Stay away <laughs> from George Clooney films. Okay. I've interviewed him and I was able to say to him that his film, The American, was responsible for my stroke. <laughs> and, <laughs> and apparently he's very, very fond of that film. And he, di he didn't take it well. Um, he's a lovely man. And then I woke up the next morning lying on the floor, unable to get up. Yeah. And I'd had a stroke in the night, yeah. Wow. And that's the thing, you know, it's one of those things that I think we... We all know can happen, but of course you never think it's going to happen. You to never you. do. You always think strokes happen to older people. Mm. And actually, since I've had the stroke, I've been in lots of hospitals and clinics and so forth, surrounded by p kids in their 20s, young people in their 30s, lots and lots of people, young mothers and so on, who've had strokes. It's quite common. But we don't hear much about it. But now, right now, you see, for someone who's been through, and I know it was a very major stroke, you know, you are remarkably um, active. I've seen you walking around town out there on your own. You came down those stairs without a Just, And obviously, it's yeah. a, you know, it's a challenge, but you're doing it. So you're, you're pushing yourself back into it. But how bad was it? Was there a chance it, that you would have lost your life? Um, my family, I was out of it at the time. My family were told twice he's a goner. He's not going to make it. And then the, the third time, I think, they were told he will make it, but he's going to be a vegetable in a wheelchair oh. for the rest of his life. Now, luckily, I, I, I hadn't heard those bits, but the family had to cope with that. Um, the answer is I'd lost quite a big chunk of the old um, cauliflower, um, about that much probably at the back, which means that everything on the left-hand side didn't work. Arm, leg, lung, um, tongue, everything on the left-hand side was out. And actually, that was lucky. Had, it, had the stroke been on the other side, I'd have lost my memory, my speech wow. and so forth, which in our business would not have been a great thing. Not a great thing, no. No. Um, and yet you have speech back now, so have you... Is, this, is it coming back gradually? Will you get back to full 100% performance as before? Or? I will never be 100% again, but I will be most of the way there. And it's one of those simple things. The more work you do, the more physiotherapy, the, do, the more strength training you do, the better you'll be. But you have to do it every day, probably for years and years and years. And the one thing that I'm really passionate about and want to say is that I'm really lucky because I had enough money to pay for physiotherapy every day when I came out of hospital. I still do it almost every day. Most people can't afford that. And we're brilliant at this in this country at saving people's lives from stroke. Fantastic. As good as anywhere. But once we save their lives, we're very, very bad at helping them get back to normal health and strength. So there's lots and lots of people all around the country who are in their 20s, their 30s and so on, and they're in a wheelchair or they can't walk and they can't work. And they're going to spend 50 or 60 years dependent on the state, um, 
unable to pay taxes, unable to work and have a full life. And with a bit of physiotherapy, we could turn that around. And as a country, we have to give people physiotherapy after stroke. So it would be actually... Uh, it would be... <laughs> it would not just be the right thing to do, it would also make sense in terms of the impact on the economy, I guess. Spending a well, bit of money early on would actually repay it because they'd be back exactly serving a useful so. function. And I, I, you know, I say to actually, you know, you want to get people back to work, you think people should be off their backsides, um, earning tax. Well, a lot of them are on their backsides in a wheelchair because they can't get off their backsides. Help them get off their backsides, earn some money, contribute to the economy. You know it makes sense. There must be charities involved, though, that we could help out who are helping to, to fund that kind of... Uh, this is the Stroke Association. It's a wonderful charity which I'm involved in called Arnie. A-R-N-I, which stands for Action on Rehabilitation for Neurological Injuries. And I think I'll stick with Arnie. That's easier Arnie. for me to do. Yeah. <laughs> and what that does is it trains, it trains people to help stroke survivors, usually with weight training, kettlebells and that kind of stuff. Quite tough stuff. And you're doing that as well, I am doing that yeah. as well, yeah. all around the country. The thing as well which impressed me very much, and this is, I think, once again, something which we can all really learn from this, I think, which is that you, you focused on the creative side Absolutely. of yourself, really, not just your life, but you kind of found a... you, you re-engaged with a, a love that you'd had since childhood, didn't you? I've always been a drawer. Uh, ever since I was that high, I've drawn pictures. And when there wasn't paper, I used to get in terrible trouble at home by drawing on the walls of the house. I'd move the furniture to one side, draw all over the wall, move it back again, and Mum would find it eventually. You were, get... You're like the first Banksy. First Banksy, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, precisely so. And I've done it all my life. I've painted. It's very difficult to, to paint with, without two hands. I'm one-handed, effectively, still at the moment. Though that will change. And that's because, but, I guess, you need the other hand to hold the to paper? Hold the, and... Yeah, to unscrew the, the tubes, uh, to wash the brushes, all that kind of stuff. But I'm drawing a lot, and I'm getting a huge amount out of it. So what do you think you get out of it? Because, I mean, I kind of know what you've been saying about this, but I'd love to hear you explain it, because it's, it's more than just the, 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 the idea of trying to create something, isn't it? It is. It's quite difficult to explain, but the way I, I, I would explain it is that all of us, we get up in the mornings, brush our teeth, go to work, have a day, uh, come back, go to sleep again. And it's very rarely in that day that you stop and think, how amazing to be alive, how fantastic to be here in this sunlit world, it's sometimes sunlit, at this moment in my life, to be able to do all these things and to appreciate the world around you. It's a bit like, and when you're drawing, you're thinking about nothing than what you're looking at. You're thinking, what a fantastic, beautiful scene or a face or whatever it might be. And you're out of yourself. And it allows you to just appreciate the extraordinary luck of being alive. And it's as simple as that. And to be right in that moment, which is a hard thing the to achieve. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, Andrew has a book that he's written out. And there, once again, it must have been hard for you because you couldn't type immediately after the stroke, I guess. Yes, I did it all with a dictation machine. So there's the book, which is a, a short a book about drawing. And it's kind of, it tells a story about your journey uh, back to health, but also the way you re-engage with this creative side of your life and I found it just a, a thrilling... It's kind of zen of drawing. Really loved it and we have uh, this is your sketchbook that you carry around with is that right? This is a good example I mean wherever I go I've got a big um, coat and in one pocket of the coat there'll be lots of pencils and pens and another pocket a little notebook and I'll just draw what's around me. Are these are fabulous and are these um, are these after the stroke or before? Those the are after the stroke. Oh, that's, that, incredible. that's just the last well, look month. Look at this this is this is from uh, the uh, is that where's that? Uh, that's so in the Tate Gallery okay, and that's Tate Epstein's one. amazing statue look of two at that, angels that embracing. Right? So instead of writing in words what's happened to me during the day I just draw things that I've seen during the day. And these are some you did quickly for us in the uh, in the green room just now. There's a picture of Abby and I'm not sure and that's Mary who that's came along Mary with you today. Mary who came with me in the background. Okay. And here we've got John Newman and Uma. No, is this true? Uma helped you with your recuperation? Yes. Well? Those of you who remember uh, Kill Bill, Kill Bill 1, there's a moment where Uma has had a rather rough time and she's waking up in hospital and there's one toe which is trying to make move. And if she can make the toe move, then all the recovery will follow and she'll be chopping people's heads off at a great rate of knots. <laughs> and it's a bit like that with me. I, was, I, sp I spend hours and hours and hours trying to make a finger move or a toe move and I... Not hours, not weeks, months, and then eventually you get a little bit of movement. Wow. And I, I always thought of that film at the beginning. Yeah. Wow. And did you go out and get yourself a yellow tracksuit with a black stripe down the side? <laughs> and a, Neither and that nor a samurai sword, <laughs> sword no. <laughs> oh, no. Has, has anyone else ever said that that movie, because you think of Kill Bill as it's a kind of... It's not therapeutic, not, crazy, not, a thera not a movie you would show to recovering stroke victims, necessarily. <laughs> no, but a lot of women found it very therapeutic. <laughs> yeah, I bet they did. Um... <laughs> <laughs> made the world just a little more dangerous for the rest of us. Um, OK, Andrew, love it having you here. I'm so pleased you're so fully on the road to recovery. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, it's great to be here. Andrew Marley, gentlemen. <laughs> oh, Andrew, thank you so much. Thank you. After the break, I'll be chatting with Uma Thurman and we'll have music from the fabulous John Newman. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed.
indeed. Welcome back. Let's get my next guest out. Even if she'd only starred in two movies, Pulp Fiction and Kill Bill, then she would deserve a start on Hollywood's Walk of Fame. But, of course, there are so many more memorable films she's made, including the most recent. She has a role in Lars von Trier's new movie, Nymphomaniac. Will you please welcome the incredible Uma Thurman? <laughs> Uma, I love it. See, again, I'm loving this. What a great look. It's a great outfit. Oh, well, thank you. You too. So, Nymphomaniac. Nymphomaniac. Okay. Yes, uh, was, for real. When they sent you the script, was it already called Nymphomaniac? It or? was. Okay, so you knew what you were getting yourself into, so to speak. Yes. Okay. Yes, but I, I am one of the only people who does remain clothed. Yes, we don't during, see your Which bits. is why I'm in the trailer a lot, I think, because there's <laughs> little they can put in. Well, we see <laughs> everyone else's bits. I mean, and you see there's a lot of bits involved. There's plenty of bits involved, and there's... Probably, I have no idea how many dozens or hundreds of bits of people it took to create this montage of, of bits, because I think they had stunt bits. Oh, so we're not seeing all the bits that we think are connected to those people. That's not no, necessarily their bits. No, they're tricks of the camera, I think. You know, right. some of them. But you don't know which are real bits and which are whose bits. Because and... some bits are bigger than others. Some, well, there's, well, you get all the bits there. Is that why people want other people's bits to be their bits, that their bits aren't as big as they, they would like their bits to be, so they get another a, a bit double in? That's the great thing about the movies, is you can have anyone's bits be your bits, and as soon as you've got a really good bit. Oh. <laughs> Let's, uh, before we show, we're going to show you the trailer of the movie. I was going to show a clip with you in, but I thought, because your scene is very intense and very dramatic, to show it out of context seemed a bit weird. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Uh, but how would you describe the film? Is it, do you have a, is there a kind of message that you send out about the movie to people? Um, well, I don't know. Um, I think that, I mean, the, the title really is the subject. <laughs> it's about a woman who's... It's says, really yeah. about nymphomania. And it's about a person whose life is sort of based upon their, like, insatiable need for sex. Would you like to see a little bit of the movie, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah! OK, this is the trailer for the film. Nymphomaniac opens next Saturday. Have a look at this. My name is Joe. Hi, Joe. Hi, Joe. And I'm a nymphomaniac. Sex addict. We say sex addict. I know that. <laughs> Would it be all right if I show the children the whoring bed? about the young star in the movie, who I don't believe you have a scene in, but you must have met on the promotion of it, Shia LaBeouf, who yes. many of you would know from, you know, bigger commercial movies like the Transformers film. I've always thought he was a gifted actor. He uh, is. Yeah, and, but he seems to be going through some kind of a, a weird kind of meltdown right now. It is, it is, it is, it is apparently he's having a something go on. He's having a moment. I don't know how to interpret the paper bag, to tell okay. you the truth. Well, the... I mean, I'm jealous. I've many times wished I could have put a paper bag over my head before I went to a premiere, so I'm glad he thought of it first. Well, this is, yeah, this is <laughs> Shia LaBeouf as he arrived at the premiere. OK. OK, there we go. <laughs> It's a funny thing about doing that is it makes you far more famous to do it. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Turning up with I am not famous anymore written on your face is a way of getting even more famous. It's, well, it's, look what's happened now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you think this will catch on? Maybe. I mean, maybe there'll be, like, Chanel paper bags and <laughs> Givenchy paper bags and it'll become a total trend, you know? You can wear anything you want to... You look good in a paper bag, right? Well, Isn't that the saying? You know what? If you can't turn up, you can't make it the premiere, send a friend along with the in bag a paper on bag. <laughs> Uh, let me ask you about the great, the wonderful, the uniquely talented Mr. Quentin Tarantino. Yes. Uh, three of your most... Uh, Affectionately, uh, QT. QT, you say. Now, uh, of course, you worked with him in Pulp Fiction, and that was a mm -hmm. huge hit. But the, the Kill Bill films, and some people might know this, that was sort of your idea, wasn't it? No, it wasn't my idea. Um, it, it was... It started off in a, in a, in a late-night conversation, and he was educating me about genre films. And then from there, we got going about... A, you know, from him telling me what a genre of film was, <laughs> literally, to, um, you know, spinning into this idea of this character and this revenge, you know, sort of set up for this woman. And, and then he went and he, you know, he gave, he sort of, he birthed the idea. He wrote about, I don't know, 10 or 15 pages. And that was the time when we were doing Pulp Fiction. And I, you know, who, you, and he gave them to me and I read them. And, um, and, you know, you don't think much of it. And then he went back to it. And he, and he wrote what was going to be one film and then was split into two. 
But uh, Kill Bill, because I thought you came up with you came up with the idea of her being a bride who had this terrible thing. We did to it. Her. It was just sort of in this conversation, you know. Um, I would never take credit for Quentin's work. I think it does speak for itself. And have you still got those jumpsuits? Because you must have used more than I one. I have. Of I have probably that jumpsuit <laughs> soaked in blood, um, turning very brown and crusty in some in some wardrobe bag somewhere. Uh, and, when, and when you're filming a movie like that, do you allow the kids... I, I, I imagine your children haven't seen the finished film yet. How old is your oldest though? They're 15 now, isn't uh, She's now 15, yeah. So she could see it. 15, you could show a 15-year-old. They, yeah, they did see it. In fact, but it, there, was a, there was a sort of precursor set up. You know, Quentin came for dinner and um, m my son said, so, you know, what is Kill Bill uh, about? He's very together, my son. And he goes, well, it's about this woman and um, this man, and he uh, is really mad at her, and he, he puts a gun in her head, and he blows her brains out, and she's pregnant, <laughs> and he's going on explaining this to my son, and my son's sitting there like... <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, like, really? Mommy's friend is really nice. Wow, what a nice movie he thought of for Mommy. <laughs> I, I watched it again recently, and I'd forgotten. I think maybe I enjoyed it more now. I loved them when they first came out, but mm -hmm. I think they stand the test of time so well. I mean, you must have a good feeling, having made something which you know is, is essentially a classic. And it's it is of... a classic. It is a cl And, and uh, what Andrew said was so touching, you know, that, I mean... Uh, for, I must say as well, to be on this show tonight with such incredibly talented people, and um, and uh, there were some moving things said tonight. The, if it gave him any help or support, it's a wonderful thing. Hey, well, and, and Given it's kind of a wild, crazy... Well, well, let's face it, who would have thought Kill Bill would It's a hand-holder. <laughs> no, he wouldn't yeah. think of it as a hand-holder. Uh, so what do you have? Because I know that you're, you're obviously very family-centred, and you have been Yeah, well, I just... I had a child um, who is now what I call a teen baby. She's 19 months. Um, and so I'm just sort of... I did the Lars movie because I couldn't resist. Um, and, but it, you know, wasn't like this... You know, I didn't have to go commit to a long production. Well, I guess because it's one, one big it scene. It was one big one scene, scene and I actually did it in one big day. So, and, you so know, it's a day, so a few days all, all yeah, time. Yeah, so that was easy. So I, since then I haven't figured out what exactly I want to do next. So I'm in the process of figuring that out. But, you know, we, uh, before you go, I know you're here, you're going to be giving out an award at the big BAFTA ceremony this coming weekend. Yes. That's always exciting. Very. Uh, but also you're meeting the Queen. Yes, I have been invited. Now, have you met the Queen before? No. Okay. Uh, do you, are you uh, have you boned up on the protocol? I've been you? I've been asking and being receiving some information. I'm I'm, I'm going to be boning up a lot. Okay. Uh, a few days to go. I've met the Queen a few times. And so, will you do, what do you want to tell me? Uh, well, uh, you're meant to wait uh, until the Queen engages you in conversation. I heard that too. And not ask questions. And I heard not to ask her any annoying questions. I can't help myself. Every time I've met her, I've asked her. <laughs> No. Yes. That's because it's what you do for a living. I said once, hey, you have it. Have you ever asked her? But, but, but I... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Tragically, are you going to her, one of her places, aren't you? Yes. Which one are you going to? Buckingham Palace. Buckingham Palace, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so excited. I know. I feel very, uh, uh, very can privileged. I, can I check in advance? Yes. And you probably have thought of this. Tell me. So probably I'm gonna, not. I'm going to look closely to see if I see the flicker of an, an, an untruth coming out. OK, look closely. Have you planned on stealing anything as a memento <laughs> of your occasion at Buckley Palace? You have thought no, about it. No, but what a great idea. You could just, <laughs> there'll be stuff in the toilets they won't Yeah, notice. you could take those little sticky things that they put on the loo paper, you know? Matches? <laughs> Ooh, I would take, like, a, a vase. Something like that. <laughs> Yeah. You if would it, go for a full-on vibe. Take a big... Well, here's my advice. Take a large, empty bag. <laughs> <laughs> Get what you can. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, you must have met the Queen, I'm sure, haven't you? Yes, I have, indeed. Um, she once famously mistook me for Vladimir Putin. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. Wow. That's not good. Wow. And then how did you disabuse her of this fact? Well, I didn't... Putin had arrived here for a state occasion, and mm -hmm. the two of them were in an open carriage and talking via a translator. Uh -huh. And when they got to the palace, according to a friend of mine at the palace, somebody asked her, Mom, you were talking to the Russian president very vigorously. What were you talking about? And she said, I can't remember. I was just trying to say to myself, this is the president of Russia and not that chap here from the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> Uma, lovely to have you here, uh, and congratulations! It's a fabulous performance in *Infomania*. Well, I think you. it's, uh, and once again, it's a movie which, um, if you you've got a broad mind and you're interested in in the human condition, <laughs> examined in a in a very kind of um, uncompromising way. Detailed. Check it out, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> join me in saying thank you to the spectacular Uma Thurman. <laughs>
Also, to my other guests tonight, James Corden, Abby Clancy and Andrew Marr. But now, he's up for a Brit for Best British Single Before We Love Me Again. It's Mr Don Newman. Your heart on, is that what devil's store? Took you so long, where only fools go. I shook the angel in your heart. Now I'm rising from the ground. Rising up to you. Feel with all the strength I found. Live FA Cup action tomorrow lunchtime at 1 here on ITV. Everton take on Swansea City. Tomorrow night, the war rages on.